Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank organizers to invite me for to present uh, this data from Botswana, and I'm happy to share with you our recent uh, findings uh, from a uh, pilot study in, in Botswana, which is we call Machudi study. This is our one study from MP3 program funded by NIH. The study uh, has finished last year, and right now analysis is ongoing, data is cleaning, but I'm happy to present some preliminary data. So let me start with uh, the notion of sub-epidemics. Um, everybody knows that this is a pretty well-established term that was used for um, more than a decade in the field. And normally, sub-epidemics uh, sub are used to divide the global epidemic in, into, into um, smaller pieces that are caused by concentrated epidemics and the most, <clears throat> the most useful uh, and widely used metric for defining uh, sub-epidemics is risk groups. And these studies were published in Italy. Uh, there were in 20 regions in Italy where they were shown how they differ by size, by temporal trends, by risk composition. Uh, and then after uh, Italian studies, they were shown uh, similar analysis was performed in Finland, in Latvia, in Malaysia, in China, and a recent review in current opinion of HIV and AIDS by Frank Tenzer kind of summarized all this approach of using sub-epidemics as a metric for um, dividing the global epidemic. What I'm going to talk uh, today uh, is a slightly different approach. We use the same terminology, um, uh, sub-epidemics, but we use phylog phylogeny of uh, viral sequences collected in uh, communities in order to uh, determine these sub-epidemics. So we associate we associate viral lineages, distinct viral lineages, and when I say distinct, I mean, I mean phylogenetically distinct uh, viral lineages that can be defined as clusters uh, from the community and that they represent some trackable, um, uh, trackable sub-epidemics. What is important to uh, say is that uh, when we identify these viral lineages, we are not talking about directionality of viral transmission, uh, because this is not really important. What is the most important thing, where new uh, infections will fall in. Say we have this community with identified uh, sub-epidemics that are shown on the right, and then uh, in, in some time we ask the question, uh, where feed new HIV infections. And this is particularly important in order to distinguish, and I'm glad that in previous session there were so heated discussion uh, in relation to what is, what is the role of uh, TASP versus PrEP. And I think our approach um, has a potential to actually address this question. Say, if new infections fit within of one of these clusters, and the sampling coverage, the genotyping coverage in particular communities is pretty high, you can be pretty comfortable and have higher probability that the transmission occurred within this community. But if you see this isolated red, red square in, in this community that doesn't fit within any existing clusters or viral lineages, so you have a better idea that it's probably originated from somewhere outside of this community. So in this case, the question is what the proportion of infections that occurred within the community versus what the proportion of infections originated from outside of community. And I think with this phylogenetic approach, we have some power uh, to distinguish what should be the contribution of PrEP in this community versus what should be uh, the contribution of TASP in this community. And again, it also depends where uh, TASP is um, applied. If it's applied in a single isolated community, it's one story. But if it's applied in surrounding communities, in a larger area, it could be a completely different story. But again, this approach with um, and concept of sub-epidemics can help to resolve these issues. So now, now let me just step back a little bit and tell you about Machudi's study in Botswana. <clears throat> so this study was started in May 2010, and the main goals were included uh, assessment of HIV incidence and prevalence during household survey on annual surveys, uh, to measure uptake of home-based HIV testing and counseling, condom use, male circumcision, uh, to infer some transmission associations, and I'm going to most about these transmission associations. Also, we measured uptake, adherence, and feasibility of treatment as prevention only in subset of individuals with high viral load, and the threshold in this study was 50,000 copies. And using all this data to uh, generate mathematical models. So, uh, Machudi is a peri-urban village in uh, south um, east of Botswana. It's about 23 miles from um, capital Gaborone. Uh, and we, our focus, our activities over three years were in northeastern sector of, uh, of Machudi. 
Um, the estimated total population based on census 2011 in maturity is 15,000 um, people of all ages. We focused on individuals from 16 to 64 years old, and estimated number based on UNA data uh, is 8,700 in this northeastern sector. Uh, during three years from May 2010 to August 2013, um, uh, the total number of people who were tested in households uh, was uh, a little bit more than 6,200. There were, there were more uh, uh, women than men, and the ratio um, women to men was 1.7. The proportion of HIV positive among those who were tested was pretty high. It was almost 20%, uh, and uh, the prevalence within females was 23.7%, while in males it was 13.4%. Uh, during this time, we identified 30 seroconverters based on uh, tested, the person was tested negative, and then during one of uh, subsequent annual um, survey, the person seroconverted. The proportion of people on antiretroviral therapy among those who were tested among, uh, was 42, 42.5%. So this is kind of a background. And we did genotyping in, in uh, everybody who was HIV positive on, on where we could get sample. Uh, we get sample primarily in household. We collected samples uh, using dry blood spots. And those who were not on antiretroviral therapy we were invited to clinic where a regular uh, venous blood draw was collected and we get plasma and buffy codes. So the genotyping data that I'm going to show you uh, represent a, a mixture of uh, sources uh, amplified and sequenced from dry blood spots and from um, buffy coats and plasma. This slide shows the distribution of HE positive individuals uh, by gender and, and by age group. And you can see that within a population from 30 to 44 years, uh, the prevalence was higher in both genders, but in women it, it uh, reached higher than 40%. We quantified viral load in uh, everybody who was sampled and tested. And um, if you break down, this is the first, the first uh, cartoon shows uh, total viral load and distribution by different beans um, within, uh, uh, like un under 1,000, from 1,000 to 10,000, uh, from 10,000 to 50,000, and higher than 50,000. And among art naive individuals, uh, there, we, we focused particularly on the individuals with higher than 50, uh, 50 copies as a, as a potential candidate for antiretroviral therapy uh, with uh, CD4 higher than 350, which is a national standard for initiation of antiretroviral therapy. What was a little surprising that among those who reported uh, to be on antiretroviral therapy, 13% um, had detectable viral load. And we think that this is really red flag, something went probably wrong. Uh, it could be adherence, compliance, uh, drug resistance, uh, some problems that needs to be monitored. Using dif different thresholds of viral load, we quantified the proportions uh, of people with different, with different CD4. And yellow and green here in all charts shows people eligible for antiretroviral therapy, while light blue and dark blue shows individuals not eligible for antiretroviral therapy with uh, CD4 higher than 350. And you can see that it definitely depends on the level of viral load, the proportion of these individuals. So this, the sampling coverage was about 72%, and it was uh, pretty similar among total population and HIV positive. When we performed G HIV genotyping, um, and overall we generated uh, 1,257 uh, envelope sequences, 99.3 uh, individuals belong to subtype C, while 0.7% were not subtype C. There were A1, um, A recombinants A1, G, G, J recombinant, and CRF forms 10 and 11. Regarding the HIV subtype C genotyping coverage, <clears throat> it was 64% uh, among those who tested in household, but we also had a subset of individuals who with previous samplings from the same location, and together with these samples, the genotyping coverage uh, was increased to 72%. If you also add those who were not subtype C, it, 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 comes to, it stays basically at the same level, 72%. So our... Um, Algorithm for identification of viral lineages uh, was multi-step. We started with multiple sequence alignment, and I'm not going um, to talk about details how we did it. It was, it was uh, relatively complex, uh, combined um, by pieces of sequence alignment. Then we applied 
we, we filtered out sequences that belong that didn't belong to subtype C. We use a recombination analysis, and surprisingly, there were very few um, sequences within subtype C with uh, uh, with uh, signals uh, with recombination signals, and there were also included from or excluded from analysis. And then our primary analysis of screening was based on maximum likelihood analysis and bootstrap value. Uh, we used three different approaches for um, uh, FAST3, MEGA6, and RAXML. We use, we use our primary threshold for defining um, clusters was 0 0.8, but we use sensitivity analysis at the level 0 0.7 and 0 0.9. I'm not going to talk about um, uh, the, the next step of analysis. Uh, this, uh, Clusters that sequences that were identified to clusters were, were further analyzed with Bayesian methods, and this is where we addressed um, addressed uh, different parameters within clusters. But this is outside of the scope of this presentation. So we asked how many different viral lineages we can see, and um, by saying viral lineages, I mean some clusters with sufficient bootstrap support. Particularly in this case, I'm showing results with uh, with bootstrap support equal or higher than 0 0.8. So. 175 uh, lineages, and this includes two plus members in, in, in each viral lineage. And from those, uh, 154 or 88% uh, were only from maturity. And this is not surprising because our sampling was primarily from maturity. We had, we had some sequences from outside of maturity, but their def different density and sampling coverage was much lower outside of maturity than in maturity. So uh, I, would, I would take this very cautiously until we have some additional samplings from outside from different communities. And so from uh, this outside of communities, only 12% of sequences were within these clusters. And we also did analysis with uh, other subtypes of sequences from South Africa, Zimbabwe, uh, Zambia, Malawi. And what was surprising that basically individuals from which you didn't, didn't cluster, didn't form any cluster with, with uh, sequences that were in the database, at least in the Los Alamos database from surrounding countries, which was quite a surprising. At least we expected to see something, but we didn't. Uh, so the number of sequences the, uh, within these clusters were also 34.7%, uh, this is the uh, total number of sequences that were found within clusters, and uh, not surprising, the majority of the sequences were within maturity unique clusters. When we looked at pairwise distances, uh, we saw that this, or the histogram at the bottom shows the overall distribution of uh, pairwise distances um, uh, throughout. This is p-distances, this is the simplest uh, just enumeration of the sequences. We showed, we quantified the pairwise distances within clusters, and there were, they didn't even overlap with distances uh, between clusters, and they were definitely on the left sh shoulder of this distribution. Uh, the cluster size distribution followed a power law, uh, and it was not surprising, and dyads, uh, I mean, uh, six, uh, clusters with two members, there were majority 126, while three plus clusters, there were 49 of those. And when we compared viral load, mm, the, uh, the viral load in, 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 uh, among people who didn't cluster it did not differ between uh, non-cluster and dyads, but it, differed, but it was higher uh, within three plus clusters, but distribution was very broad. Uh, this uh, maximum likelihood tree shows the distribution of uh, seroconverters. We were able to uh, sequence 26 of, out of 30 seroconverters, and nine of these uh, 26 uh, were found in clusters. Uh, but none of this of newly identified seroconverters cluster with each other. They all, even when they were found in clusters, they belong to different clusters. Um, then individual clusters were analyzed for uh, social and demographic and clinical parameters. And in STARS, these two sequences with high bootstrap support, um, uh, they belong to the same household. Um, and the green, green here shows incident case within this cluster. Um, we also addressed the question when the majority transmission happened within uh, each of this viral lineage as, as sub-epidemic. And these two different examples, this light blue vertical line shows where the nodes concentrated within this cluster. And in, in first case, it's uh, the majority of transmissions, we interpret this as happened around year 2000, while the majority of transmissions in the second uh, shown cluster happened between 2008 and um, to, to 2010. Um, there, I can talk a, 
more about this, but my time is off, so I'm going to finish with some um, preliminary conclusions. So this is definitely ongoing study, um, and uh, I just want to highlight that's dividing, uh, using phylogeny as a metric for dividing uh, the whole epidemic into sub-epidemic looks like interesting approach, uh, and particularly when um, you sequence viruses circulating in community, you, you, you can have much better idea what's going on in, uh, in community, and uh, you can identify the structure of HIV epidemic in this community. I want to warn uh, to take this data with cautious because there's definitely probability that depends on the genotyping coverage, on uh, the extent of missing data and uncertainty of phylogenetic methods used. Uh, and um, geographic origin of new transmissions uh, should allow us to distinguish uh, HIV infections newly uh, identified either within community or outside a community. We published a couple of papers recently in PLOS One and PLOS Computational Bi Biology where we uh, reflected some of um, uh, this data that I told you, uh, and I would like to um, acknowledge study participants, uh, team in Botswana, and team at Harvard, and our sponsors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Jeffrey Joy. He's working for BC Center for Excellence in HIV and AIDS. So speaking, uh, the title is Genetic Diversification and Population Level Philodematic uh, Analysis of the British Columbia HIV and HCV Police. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and thanks very much to the organizers for letting me speak about this here. And thanks to all of you for being here when you could be digesting your lunch or something. Um, so today I'm going to tell you about phylodynamic analyses, and you, you might ask, what is that? So I'll tell you first what phylodynamic analyses are, and then use the examples from the BC HIV and HCV epidemics to show how useful it can actually be. First of all, what is a virus phylogeny? So a virus phylogeny, you can think of that as a family tree of virus sequences. And the structure of that family tree of viruses actually contains an incredible amount of information about the processes that have structured the epidemic and the outcome that we see. And we can tell that simply by taking the sequence data and building a tree, which is amazing. Central to a lot of the um, inferences that you can draw from trees like this are that the branch lengths are scaled proportional to time. So the distances between the nodes are representing time instead of genetic distance. So what is phylodynamics? It's the study of how epidemiological and immunological processes act and interact to shape viral phylogenetic trees. Uh, and it's a complementary approach to traditional epidemiological approaches. And importantly, it, it's done using only the viral sequence data. So it's sort of Catholic to all of the other information. And so it's unbiased in a sense. What I want to talk about today, so it, phylo, phylodynamic methods can give you all kinds of things from incidence to transmission rates to uh, prevalence to, and you can take these quantities and you can then phylogenetically map them onto the landscape to learn about where the epidemic is, is going when. Um, today though, I'm gonna focus on lineage accumulation, which you can think of as being uh, proportional to prevalence. And so lineage accumulation is, um, basically it's the cumulative number of infections in a dated molecular phylogeny on a logarithmic scale, which is the y-axis, um, graphed against time, the time when those infections arise, which is on the x-axis. So we're going to use this one tool to talk about the British Columbia HIV and HCV epidemics. So on the left there, you see a tree based on uh, more than 27,000 HIV poll sequences. And on the right, you see um, a tree that is based on 536 HCV NS5B sequences. And those colors just represent the different genotypes. So in the HIV phylogeny, uh, 
we have, we have the sequences annotated by risk factor, which allows us to make comparative inferences about the different sub-epidemics, which Vlad was just talking about. Um, so the red bar is MSM, uh, the blue bar is IDU, the green bar is hetero, and the brown bar is, is people that are infected with blood products. And those colors will be used throughout the rest of the plots. So this is now a plot of lineage accumulation in the BC HIV epidemic. Uh, and again, I'm going to point out that the, the number of HIV lineages is on the um, y-axis. And, and again, it's important to note that that's a log scale. Um, and then time is again on the x-axis. And you can see that, that these 27,000 sequences give us a lot of power, actually. And so even though people in, that were infected here in British Columbia were not here in you know, the early 1900s, that the sequences actually allow us to recover the actual age of the HIV epidemic, which is amazing, just from the sequence data. And so Julio said yesterday that HIV arrived here shortly after he did in 1983. Uh, so this is not that. <laughs> um, and yes, so breaking this branching structure of the tree down by the risk factors allows comparison of the epidemic within different at-risk populations. And so let's zoom in and very carefully look at the time window that's actually really relevant to us here. And you can see from this, again, it's a log scale. Uh, you can see from this that there are very different epidemic dynamics that we can actually extract out of this tree structure just using this one simple lineage accumulation plot. Um, one really notable inference that Julio again mentioned yesterday is that there was a big sort of bump in accumulation of lineages in the IDU population in the mid to late 1990s and early 2000s. And then that, that's been followed by subsequent tapering off. And in the blood products, you can see that basically once there were a few infections, there have been no subsequent real accumulation of infections. Um, and all of the lines, to see, you can see them sort of tapering off. So that shows us that we can use these plots uh, to, sh to reveal differences in epidemic dynamics that are detectable in measures that are drawn from these trees. That the IDU epidemic underwent a notable decrease, increase in lineages in the mid 1990s, followed by subsequent declines, and that the BC HIV epidemic is now overall in decline across and across at risk populations. Let's now look at HCV, and so this is our distribution of our HCV genotypes, and you can see that here in British Columbia we have predominantly genotype 1A, and that's consistent with other places in North America which also have predominantly 1A. And if we then break that tree down again by the lineages, and it's important also to notice, aside from the log scale on that axis, that it's really the slope of the line that's important. So whether it's like this or like that. So if it's sort of flat, then that means there's not, we're not really accumulating any more lineages. If it's sort of like this, then that, that means we actually are accumulating lineages at that point in time. And so instead of breaking this epidemic down by risk factor, I'm going to break this one down by age and sex. And again, we're going to spend a bit of time on this plot. And again, keep in mind that it's the slope that's important of the lines. It's immediately obvious that female baby boomers are really not accumulating any more infections at this point. Um, whereas younger females um, are accumulating a few infections. Looking at male baby boomers, they are accumulating far less infections at the present than younger males. And another thing that you can take from this plot that is really surprising actually is that the big change in when the number of people were infected with HIV was quite a lot earlier than we expected. So it's around 70 years ago there was a big jump in the number of infections. And that's earlier than we thought. And this is uh, so a, a result that was independently validated by the CDC in Atlanta, actually, as well. So it's, it's a real pattern. So in conclusion, 
inferences drawn directly from sequence data can provide independent confirmation of epidemic patterns for both HIV and HCV. And these phylogynamic kind of analyses complement our existing data for both HIV and HCV. And sort of the future work here, uh, we're looking at diversification rates, which you can think of diversification rates as an inferred transmission rate. And we're going to evaluate the effect of treatment on different rates of viral lineage accumulation. Uh, and we're also going to map different quantities like resistance and compare that to how diversification rate maps on the landscape. So we may see areas of high viral diversification rate that are also areas of high resistance. And with that, uh, I'd like to especially thank the BC Center for Excellence Molecular Lab and funding sources and everybody for coming. And the BC Center for Disease Control for nicely presenting or prov providing the, C the uh, HCV data. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for keeping the time as well. Uh, can I please invite now Anne Dewar uh, from the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Uh, she will be presenting on detecting uh, MSM and trans women uh, with acute recent infection for TASP strategies. Thank you. Thank you. I'm presenting this talk um, for my colleague Javier Lama, who is the uh, site PI for this study in Lima and who was unable to be here today. So um, we were really interested in looking at uh, the question of when we should start uh, TASP interventions. And really, uh, I think everyone in the room is familiar with um, the, the dialogues that have gone on about whether we should be starting uh, TASP to try to bring in everyone uh, who has CD4 counts of 350 and below, or 500 according to the new guidelines. Or I think as most people in this room feel, we should be uh, really treating everyone who, uh, we detect H in whom we detect HIV infection as soon as we detect it. And that's this larger box uh, representing the universe of seropositive individuals. So the question that we wanted to raise is, what about the individuals in this pink box here? This is a time when viral load is very high, uh, the HIV swarm may be particularly transmissible at this point, and so uh, should we do our best to try to include these people in TASP interventions? And one of the issues here is that at least some of these people are not detected with standard serologic assays, so it's more work. And um, we contend that even though it's more work, it's probably worth it. And the reason for that is that this time of very early infections may be a time when there's a lot of onward transmission. These are estimates from a series of um, mathematical uh, models and uh, estimating that in uh, North American MSM, a third to two thirds of infections occur due to onward transmission during very early infection. And similarly, phylogenetic, phylogenetic studies, such as those discussed by the previous two speakers in Montreal and in other populations of MSM, suggest that there's a substantial uh, contribution of cluster transmission. And this is seen as uh, clusters of uh, virtually identical sequences, uh, which suggests that there is rapid onward transmission from uh, people prior to the diversification of virus that is uh, during very early transmission. So we think this is an important time to interrupt transmission chains. So that was our hypothesis that really by um, intervening very early, we could reduce transmissions in uh, high risk populations such as MSM. And it would have been fantastic to get enough money to do this as a cluster randomized trial, but uh, we're not there yet. So we're looking um, at what we think may give us a good approximation by looking at the effect of immediate versus deferred uh, ART uh, in, on viral decay di dynamics in particularly semen and rectal secretions from uh, MSM and trans women in, in Lima. And and then we are modeling um, the impact on transmission using both deterministic and agent-based network models. We're also looking um, at the role of alcohol and um, substance use in these populations. Our population in Lima has a very, very high rate of alcohol use disorder, about 60%. So um, we are collecting uh, data on uh, HIV phylogeny and, and really reconstructing these clusters, uh, which we think are onward trans due to onward transmission. And then we're mapping um, alcohol and substance use onto these transmission clusters, which we identify predominantly through phylogenetic analysis, but also um, secondarily through partner tracing. 
So as I said, we're doing this work in Peru. It is almost exclusively a clade B epidemic, and uh, MSM and transgender women are really disproportionately affected there, as is reflected by these very high prevalence rates and a um, three to six and a half percent uh, incidence rate in, in recent studies. So the study we're collecting, conducting there is called SABES. It's a, a feasibility study which we're conducting in MSM and transgender women uh, who self-report high-risk sexual behaviors. And we're recruiting them through uh, community-based recruiters, social media, and at entertainment venues in Lima. So far, we've screened over 2,000 people uh, with a prevalence, HIV prevalence rate of upwards of 17%. We have four testing sites throughout Lima. Uh, men are recruited and screened with a baseline uh, questionnaire, and we are uh, enrolling a cohort. Our original target was 2,400 uh, HIV negative MSM and trans women. However, we're finding that we're hitting our pre-specified uh, endpoints with even fewer men, so we'll probably close this cohort at 1,800. Uh, we do point-of-care third-generation HIV serologic tests at each visit. The uh, cohort is enrolled and tested monthly. All men who are seronegative, uh, the specimens are taken and pooled. They're tested for HIV RNA twice daily. And then we have uh, outreach workers that go and contact the men and bring them in for the third step, which is a randomized ART study, which will have roughly uh, 200 participants. So this just shows you again how these three steps are linked together. The first step is screening. Uh, men are screened uh, at every visit with a third generation point of care ELISA. Uh, men who test uh, seropositive uh, are eligible to enroll into the third step if they have a prior negative test within the last one to three months. And this is a prior HIV RNA test. Men who are uh, seronegative, uh, all specimens are tested by pooled NAT. The men who are negative on RNA and uh, serologically then go back into the cohort and are retested monthly. Those who are positive by RNA are brought in as acute infections uh, to the third step. So here's our preliminary data on um, our uh, ability to detect infections in, in this cohort. And I'll just direct your eye first to this uh, column here. Um, you can see at the beginning, this is the ramp up of enrollment into this uh, HIV testing cohort. And uh, as you can see, in the last three months, we've averaged about 10 acute or very recent infections per month. So we haven't uh, completed enrollment into our cohort, but we're getting about 10 infections a month. This is what we thought we would get with 2,400 men it's what we're getting with 1,700 men or fewer. Uh, next, just to direct you to the bottom line here, um, relatively uh, small number of men come in at FIBIG-1, uh, but we are getting quite large men, numbers of men detected at FIBIG-2. Um, those men are HIV RNA positive and P24 positive. And then you can see uh, also a reasonable number in FIBIG-3 and about uh, half of the men come in uh, when they're already seropositive but have had a very recent uh, HIV negative test. So we wanted to bring these men in, and the study design is then to randomize them to immediate atripla, which they continue for the 48-month, excuse me, 48-week um, study period, or to defer initiation of atripla for 24 weeks. And during this initial time point, we do collect very frequent uh, semen and rectal secretion specimens to look at the decay curve uh, uh, in the treated arm. That is, how much can we knock down uh, viral load in genital secretions and how fast? And just to say that anyone who meets criteria CD4 count or clinical uh, criteria or is thought in the uh, opinion of the physicians to need ART, uh, that per if that person is in the deferred arm, they are treated immediately. We also had a, um, assurance for the Ministry of Health that ART will continue for all these men. One of our questions was, could we get these men into treatment quickly? Uh, and as you can see, we get them from diagnosis to screening in three days for men with acute infection. In one day uh, for men with recent infection, they essentially just uh, enroll the same day. We screen them here for um, with a chest x-ray, uh, LFTs, et cetera, and ask them to come back in 24 to 48 hours for enrollment and ART initiation. And as you can see, that hasn't worked well. It's taken seven to 10 days to initiate ART. So we recently uh, combined these visits, and we will pre-screen uh, for safety labs and then try to enroll them uh, on the same day. Uh, 
Uh, again, as was raised yesterday, uh, we wanted to address this question of individual benefit. Uh, and this has been, I think, a, a concern for the community that they're being initiated on treatment for community benefit, but not necessarily for their own benefit. So we are um, in this, I think, very highly defined population taking advantage of the design to look at some individual treatment outcomes. Um, we are collaborating now with the uh, DARE HIV Cure Collaborative, collaborative uh, out of UCSF and the Vaccine and Gene Trans, uh, Transfer uh, Institute VGTI uh, in Florida to look at things like the establishment of the reservoir, uh, cell activation, metabolic changes, etc. And then finally, we are um, in developing protocols to look at more clinical endpoints, like whether or not this early initiation of treatment can uh, avoid the cardiovascular and neurologic outcomes um, seen uh, in many treated cohorts. So in conclusion, uh, we think it's uh, possible to detect MSM in transgender women uh, with acute and very recent infection and really to rapidly link them to care. We think that this approach will not only uh, reduce armor transmission, but have important implications for uh, individual treatment. And finally, we're doing uh, formative research with the community to try to better understand how acceptable this approach uh, is to them and uh, exactly how uh, they would best like to access these kinds of uh, tests for very early infection. And I'd just like to end here by uh, acknowledging all my collaborators in the US and in Peru, uh, by thanking my funders and acknowledging Merck and Gilead for drug donation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is uh, Ignacia Ro Rosada. Sorry, I cannot pronounce your name. And uh, he's working for BC Center for Excellence in HIV and AIDS. Please. Thank you very much for the the introduction, and thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. I'm going to start with some hepatitis C facts. Uh, hepatitis C is a major pandemic, pandemic in the world. One to three percent of the world population is infected. <coughs> Specifically, Canada has one percent of the population infected, and 75 percent of those are in BC, and this is relatively recent data. The population, the people who inject drugs are specifically affected by this epidemic. 80% of all new cases happen with, within people who inject drugs. And the prevalence rate within this population is extremely high at 65%. Um, only 1% of the, these HIV positive people who inject drugs in BC are treated yearly. And this is mostly because the treatments up, at least until recently, have been very harsh. The, you typically had a 48-week treatment and with very harsh side effects. However, we, there is an ongoing paradigm shift in treatment for HCV. The new treatments and the, the treatments that are uh, apparently one or two years away from, from being available have uh, shortened the, the treatment period to only, one, only 12 weeks with very high efficiencies. The objectives of our work in, in, in that regard are threefold. The first one is to determine, we want to determine the effect that various drug treatments are going to have on the BC hepatitis C epidemic among people who inject drugs. And we want to consider both the current therapies and the future oral direct acting antivirals. The second objective is we want to assess the effect of increasing access to treatments and engaging into risk reduction strategies upon successful completion of treatment. Again, also for people who inject drugs. And the third objective is if possible, we want to determine the conditions necessary for the elimination of the HCV epidemic among people who inject drugs. We developed a deterministic mathematical model. It's based on Elamino Bachas and uh, Martin et al.'s models from last year. There are seven compartments, we, as is fairly standard. There is an, an initial susceptible population that becomes acutely infected upon infection. Uh, they, after six months, they become chronic, and they, they stay as chronic on awares until, uh, until they become diagnosed. At that point, they become chronic aware, and they can either become not eligible for treatment or become treated, and if successful, they, would, they can either move into a risk reduction compartment, where we're, we're thinking about uh, needle substitution programs, method of maintenance, etc., where the, the risk of reinfecting is, is diminished, or they could fall to the susceptible 
group and again directly be more uh, in the risk of reinfection. Again, this risk reduction compartment is going to model the reinfection risk. And they, we, div we divided the chronic population into chronic unaware and chronic aware as a way to model the delay in access to treatment, both in the delay in, in getting tested and the delay in, in getting, being treated. The first uh, simulations that we did were uh, basically trying to replicate the results from, from Martin et al.'s paper from last year. We, we looked at the effect on the incidence and the prevalence after a 15-year uh, treatment uptake with the, uh, with the proposed new direct-acting antivirals, specifically, again, looking at people who inject drugs. We can see that uh, the, the key hypothesis done in this, in this simulation is that uh, HCV-positive people who inject drugs upon infection immediately become eligible for treatment. So essentially, diagnosis occurs immediately upon infection. We did a second simulation where we added uh, the delayed effect of uh, you having to wait a little bit of time between infection and being tested. Specifically for BC, there's, there's a 14% uh, the, of the population of, of people who inject drugs that are tested uh, every year. So the, the gray bars represent the, the previous results that I showed, and the colored bars are the more modest uh, results that we get when incorporating that feature. This, the status quo is uh, the, the, the BC estimated rates of 14% yearly testing and 0.8% treating rates. We then did an alternative approach of studying the increased treatment and testing rates. We looked at the uh, controlled reproductive number. This is, this is essentially the same thing as a basic reproductive number, R0, and it has the same features. When RC is bigger than one, we are in the epidemic or stable endemic regime. RC less than one implies that over time the epidemic is going to die out. We considered four different treatment regimes. The first one, Peg interferon and rivavirin used to be the standard of care in BC up until a couple of years ago. The second uh, therapy is the current standard of care. It's uh, the peg interferon, rivavirin, and bosepravir, telaprevir, depending on genotype. The, the third uh, therapy we considered is the proposed oral interferon-free direct-acting antivirals, which have uh, very high efficiencies, low treatment duration, and the, the low amounts of side effects make them have a much greater treatment eligibility than the other therapies. And to provide an upper bound, we, we also consider uh, an optimal uh, treatment scenario where this magical treatment has 100% efficiency over one week and everybody is eligible for this treatment. The first figure that I have here, the, the, the y-axis is the, the treating rate in terms of the percentage of the population that gets treated per year and the, and the horizontal axis is the percentage of the population that gets tested per year. We want, we're measuring the RC, and again, we want to be in the dark red color. RC less than one means that the epidemic is going to die out. And we can see in this case, this is the, the previous standard of care in BC. For people who inject drugs, there is even at 100% testing and treating rates, we, won't, we wouldn't be able to, to get rid of the epidemic. Moving forward to the current standard of care, there is now a region over here where the, the epidemic would be able to die out if we had the appropriate uh, high rates of testing and treatment. However, the, we need something around 70% testing and treatment to be in the, in the R0 less than one region. Moving forward to the oral direct acting antivirals, the HCV free region or the, the, the region where the epidemic dies out increases significantly we still need something like 40% testing and treatment to be in this unstable epidemic regime. And just to give you an idea, the, the current testing and treatment rates are all the way down here. Okay, the, finally, the, the best case scenario doesn't really, I, I, just so that you can see, there, there isn't really a huge improvement within the proposed direct acting antivirals. And what I want to say with this, or point out with this is that a better treatment is not, is not going to take us out of the hepatitis C epidemic. There needs to be increased access to testing and treatment. Uh, no matter how good the treatment is, a very, very small percentage of people is getting tested and treated, specifically within the people who inject drugs population. Uh, we can recast these results in terms of the time that it takes to treat 
and the time that it takes to test a sorry the time that it takes to test a person from infection and the time that it takes to treat a person from diagnosis and the region below the black line is a region where again rc is less than 1 where the epidemic is going to die out and i i marked out this square from here to 2 years both in testing and treatment and to me this refers as the window of opportunity for a test and treat strategy if we test people within two years of infection, and if we treat people within two years of being tested, we're going to be in the unstable epidemic regime, and the model predicts that the epidemic would die out eventually. Finally, the, we, we looked at uh, another part of the model, specifically engaging people into risk reduction strategies upon successful completion of treatment. This is not captured by the RC estimation, and what we see, the, the first column really is the, the first simulation that, that I showed. There is the, we, we assume that we increased treatment up to 8%, and the, the incidence dropped by around 20% from the status quo scenario where treatment remains very, very low. However, if we, if we increase engagement, the, the, black, the black bar doesn't have any engagement in, into risk reduction. If we increase engagement up to 40%, we could drop incidence by, by twice what we originally had over 15 years. Finally, I just wanted to mention the, the following conclusions that we got from our work. At the, the, the first thing that is inescapable is that the, at the current testing and treating rates, oral direct acting antiviral treatments, despite their high levels of uh, efficiency, are going to have a minimal effect on the hepatitis C epidemic in people who inject drugs. The second conclusion that we have is that a test and treat strategy with a two by two year window in time to test and time to treat is predicted to eliminate the people who inject drugs HCV epidemic. And finally, we saw that engaging to risk reduction after achieving sustained virological response is projected to significantly reduce overall incidence, not only reinfection incidence, but overall incidence within the people who inject drugs population. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Gupta from UNH, and she's going to be presenting on the antiretroviral treatment for prevention of HIV and tuberculosis, an update on current and planned research efforts. Thank you, and thank you, organizers, for the opportunity to present today. On behalf of UNH, AVAC, and all the researchers who've contributed to this work, I'll present the results of the report on ART for prevention of HIV and TB, an update on current and planned research efforts. There is considerable scientific evidence showing that ART reduces the risk of progression to AIDS, including tuberculosis, non-AIDS illness, and deaths. ART also has substantial potential for prevention of HIV transmission, as demonstrated by biological and observational studies from British Columbia, San Francisco, South Africa, Taiwan, and the HPTN-052 trial. In 2013, WHO revised its guidelines to recommend ART at CD4 less than 500 for asymptomatic people living with HIV and irrespective of CD4 count for serodiscontent couples, pregnant women, children less than five years old, and HIV positive people with TB or hepatitis B. There is still a need for additional data on when to start ART, especially in key populations, the optimal mix of HIV prevention interventions, and how to deliver ART that the ongoing and planned studies would provide. We summarize these ongoing and planned studies that look at the impact of ART along with other HIV prevention interventions on morbidity, mortality, and transmission. Using an internet-based search and opportunistic survey of researchers, we identified over 500 projects. We included 61 relevant studies evaluating the impact of ART at any CD4 count or ART initiation or adherence strategies on HIV transmission, viral load, HIV incidence, or risk behavior. We also looked at studies evaluating the impact of early ART at CD4 count more than 350 on HIV and TB-related morbidity, mortality, and transmission. Studies on best regimens, medication-assisted therapy, adherence monitoring, drug resistance, published studies, and purely modeling studies were excluded. Of the 61 studies, nine studies are focusing on early or immediate ART, 
while 16 studies are focusing on early ART, expanded access to ART, and seek test, treat, and retain strategies for the key population. We will discuss these studies in detail. The ninth study is including five randomized controlled trials on early ART at CD4 count less than 500 or above. Implementation and observational studies on early ART are planned and ongoing in South Africa, Swaziland, and Uganda. The research results from these studies are expected to be available between 2014 and 2017. The red dots in this map represent the countries with studies on early ART. The study sites are located in diverse settings with varying HIV prevalence and economic resources. Also, many countries have revised their guidelines to recommend early ART. While nine countries in blue and British Columbia recommend ART irrespective of CD4 count, six countries in green consider ART at CD4 count above 500 for asymptomatic people living with HIV. Data from country experiences will be valuable for policymakers all around the world. In total, there were 19 randomized controlled trials from resource limited setting. This slide summarizes the five trials on early ART. While ART will be provided irrespective of CD4 count in three trials, the eligibility criteria is CD4 less than 800 in the Tremprano trial in Cote d'Ivoire and CD4 count above 500 in the multi country start trial. Four other randomized controlled trials and three implementation and observational studies are looking at combination HIV prevention programs, which include ART at CD4 less than 350, condoms, PMTCT, male circumcision, and behavior interventions. The results from these studies are anticipated mostly in 2016 and 2017. After the HPTN-052 trial confirmed that ART reduces the risk of HIV transmission, 26 countries in dark blue have revised their guidelines to recommend ART irrespective of CD4 count for this population. Vietnam is planning an implementation study on use of ART for serodiscordant couples, for both heterosexual couples and MSM. The evidence based on prevention benefits of ART for other key populations such as MSM, transgender people, people who inject drug and sex workers is less developed. Studies from British Columbia, Thailand and Vietnam will provide ART irrespective of CD4 count for MSM and transgender people. Also studies from British Columbia and Vietnam will evaluate the prevention benefits of ART irrespective of CD4 count for people who inject drugs. Despite our extensive search, we did not identify any studies on treatment as prevention for other key populations. The other randomized controlled trials in resource limited settings are mainly focusing on innovative seek, test, treat, and retain strategies for general population and key populations such as MSM and people who inject drugs. Of the 61 studies, funding information was available for 41, uh, 49 studies. From 2007 onwards, more than 307 million US dollars have been invested in these 49 studies. The majority of this investment has been made in North America and Africa, and the funding has come from public sector agencies from the United States. Our study has a few limitations. Despite the wide variety of research projects we identified, we might have missed some ongoing and planned studies, especially those that did not highlight ART. We excluded studies not in English, published studies, modeling studies, and studies on HIV testing and counseling, HIV care, and human rights. We included all studies that met our inclusion criteria and did not review them for ethical or quality considerations. In summary, we identified a large number of research products on, uh, projects on treatment as prevention with at least 19 randomized controlled trials in resource limited settings. There's considerable heterogeneity between the studies in terms of the study design, the interventions and outcomes, the geographical location and funding. Only a few observational studies are looking at immediate ART for key populations such as MSM and people who inject drugs. Also, research is increasingly focusing on innovative seek, test, treat, and retain strategies 
for general population and key populations. So to get to zero new HIV infections and zero AIDS deaths, increased partnership among funding agencies and researchers and policymakers is needed so that the available evidence and the new scientific evidence, especially from the observational and implementation studies, can be rapidly translated into policy and practice. So we have hard copies of short report if anybody is interested, and the full report is available online at avac.org TASP update. We are also planning a webinar to discuss this report, and we'll uh, send out the details shortly. Uh, I would like to thank AVAC and all the researchers who have contributed to this work. Thank you so much. So I, I'd like to introduce the last speaker is uh, Dr. Janek Karovina. He's working for the National Institute of the Medical Science and the Nutrition, Sawado Jubilin, and his title, uh, he will present estimating the impact of the late heart initiation among the man sex with man on the HIV transmission in Mexico. Please. Thank you. Good afternoon. The HIV epidemic in Mexico is a concentrated epidemic with 0.24% of prevalence in general population, but close to 20% in MSM. UNAIDS has estimated up to 9,000 new cases per year in all population. Antiretroviral free access exists since 2003. Heart initiation is recommended with CD4 count of 350 cells. Yet, the reality is that near 80% of people start treatment late, and mortality rates has been stable in the last 10 years. 79 of people in Mexico start treatment late, defined as a CD4 count lower than 200 cells and or an AIDS-defining event. Since a high percentage of MSN in Mexico start treatment late, it's likely that these late initiators spend a long time with HIV infection, detectable by the lot and with potential to transmit. If the time of heart initiations occurs earlier, a significant time of potential transmission could be avoided. Most of late heart initiators are subjects who ignore their HIV infection for a long time. Our aim is, is to estimate, using a mathematical model, the number of new transmissions that occur from HIV-infected MSM in the current conditions of late heart initiation, and in other more desirable scenarios, which involve earlier heart and improved detection of those infected. We have two key questions. What is the cost in the number of transmitted HIV infections with the current scenario of late heart initiation in MSM compared to hypothetical scenarios of earlier heart and better diagnosis? And how long do MSM spend since their infection until heart initiation? To solve the first question, we propose use a, mat a transmission mathematical model. For the second question, we need to adjust our CD4 count at diagnosis and heart initiation to CD4 count decline data to estimate a time of, of infection. To estimate the number of transmission originating due to MSM starting late, we designed a model based on a differential equation system. This model represents the number of MSM population in different stages defined by their HIV infection, their diagnosis, treatment initiation, and viral suppression per month during 20 years since 2011. The rates between stages for, were defined using Mexican epidemiological data available. An important input for our model is the estimated time since infection to diagnosis and heart initiation. For this, we use data from the Cascade cohort published in 2012. Extrapolating those results to our population, assuming that Mexican MSM population have the same rate of decline. Based on this data, we estimate that our MSM population spent 6.7 years until diagnosis and 7.4 years until heart initiation. 
these are the characteristics of the current scenario of our MSN population. The median CD4 count at the start is 148 cells. Another important information is that only 32% of HIV-infected MSM are aware of their HIV status. This information comes from a recent nationally representative seroprevalence study of MSM in Mexico, which was published last year. In addition to an estimated 17% prevalence in MSM, the study also collected important information on sexual risk behavior and awareness of HIV status. As mentioned before, according to Cascade data, we estimate an average of 7.4 years since infection to heart initiation. In addition to the status quo scenario, which I've just described, we simulate other four hypothetical scenarios of heart initiation according to Mexican and WHO guidelines, and with and without an improved detection of HIV in the MSN population. The target increase of diagnosis coverage was from the current 32% to 80%. The time elapsed since infection estimated in each scenario is 2.8 years to reach a CD4 count of 350 and 0.67 years to reach 500. The recent results of Cascade Cohort Study presented at CROI estimates a time of 3.5 years since infection to CD4 count of 350 cells. In this slide, we can see an estimate about the HIV care continuum in Mexico considering only MSM. It's necessary to remark that we don't have information about all the stages of the continuum, and it is possible the official data are subestimating the real numbers. According to UNAIDS and CENSIDA estimates for, every, for the year 2011, 105,000 MSM live with HIV, of whom 47,000 who were diagnosed, 40,000 on treatment, and 28,000 under viral suppression are solid known numbers from the Mexican program. But if we use the estimate reported by Bautista of 32% of HIV positive MSM now in their status, then the total number of MSM living with HIV is higher than the UNAIDS estimate, near 150,000. Of course, all the other percentages in the cascade are lower than estimated initially. The most important data is the reduction in the percentage of MSM virally suppressed of all MSM HIV positive from 27 to 19%. These are some of the input parameters used in the model related to sexual risk behavior of MSM in Mexico. Most of them were estimated from the Bautista Seroprevalence Study database and published last year. The percentage of condom use in the last anal sexual relation is 73%. The probability of having receptive sex is 64%. And three sexual risk groups were defined according to information of MSM in the survey that includes sexual role, number of sexual partners, and condom use reported. The results for each scenario modeled in the first, fifth, and tenth year are included in this table. We are including the number of the infections transmitted by MSM HIV positive groups to all population. We added transmission to women that according to official reports represents 20% of total infections in the country, 90% of them originating in MSM. In the status quo scenario, we estimate 13,425 new infections in the first year. All other scenarios show a significant reduction in the number of new infections in the first year, especially in the scenarios with improved detection. A long time, the reductions in new infections are substantial. In all hypothetical scenarios compared to the status quo ranging from 40% to 60% by the fifth year and near 90% for the 10th year of simulation. Running the model for 20 years since 2011, the accumulated number of infections transmitted by MSM to all population is shown in the panel in the left. 
and new infections per year in the right panel. A status quo scenario increases significantly to a number close to 200,000 infections accumulated in the next 20 years. In the earlier scenarios without improved diagnosis, there are important reductions in the total transmissions from the second year of simulation. The strategy with more reduction in HIV transmission is the scenario of early heart initiation according to WHO guidelines plus 80% of diagnosis increased. It's the line in pink reaching reductions in new infections from 50% to 90% at the end of simulation in the 20th year. On the right panel, we see a fast decrease in the new infections per year in the earlier scenarios, with an important reduction for the scenarios, including an improved diagnosis strategy. These are the results of a univariate analysis for the current scenario in the first year of simulation. Most variations were observed for the percentage of condom use when it changed from 73% in the baseline value to a range between 50 to 90%. As our population seems to be in the lowest risk behavior group, we are showing the results for changes in this group. The number of sexual contacts per month in the lowest risk group impact importantly the estimations, as well as the number of sexual partners per month does. Besides, changes in suppression rate cause the less impact on the estimation. A multivariate sensitivity analysis need, is needed to see their combined impact on the results of the model. As conclusions, a, sig a significant number of new HIV infections in Mexico are transmitted from non-diagnosed and untreated HIV-infected MSM. Mexican guidelines currently recommend hard initiation at CD4-350 cells. However, the reality is that HIV-infected individuals in Mexico initiate heart at significantly lower levels. Aggressive increases in HIV testing and early treatment initiation in MSMs are likely to reduce new infections in Mexico for the next years. This strategy will have an immediate important benefit for the individuals and for the HIV epidemic in the country. We have to thank to people in the clinic and patients of the cohort, authors of Mexican Zero Prevalence Study and their staff for allowing us to use their database, and the support by the National Council on Science and Technology of Mexico and the NIEAH program from the Emory University. Many thanks for your attention.